Chapter in Coiline by Neil Gaiman. Let us start. Um, this is chapter 12. Her mother shook her gently away. Coiline, she said. Darling, what a funny place to fall. Funny place to fall asleep. You really <laughs> and really, this room is only for the best. We looked, we looked all over the house for you. Quilling stretched and blinked. I'm sorry. She said, I can't sleep. I can see that, said her mother. And whoever did, did the cat come from? He was waiting by the front door when I came in. Shot out like a bullet as I opened it. Probably had to do things, said Quill. Had, had things to do with Coraline. Then she hugged her mother so tightly that her arms began to ache. Her mother hugged Coraline back. Dinner in 15 minutes, she said her mother. Don't forget to wash your hands. And just look at those pajama bottoms. What did you do to your poor knee? I tripped, said Coraline. She went into the bathroom and she washed her hands and cleaned her scraped knee, her bloody knee. She put ointments on her cuts and scrapes. She went into her bedroom, her real bedroom, her true bedroom. She pushed her hands into her pockets of her dressing gown and pulled, and she pulled, she pulled out three marbles, a stone with a hole in it, the black key, and an empty snow globe. She shook the snow globe and watched the glittering snow swirl through the water to fill the empty world. Uh oh. She put it down and watched the snow fall. Fall covering the place where down watch the snowfall covering the place where the little couple had won. Bobby, clean up. Clean up. Thank you. took a thread, a piece of string from the toy box, and she strung the black key on the string. Then she knotted the string and hung it around her neck. There she said. And she put it on some, some clothes and hid the key under her t-shirt. It was pulled against her skin and the stone went to her into her pocket. Coraline walked down the hallway to her father's study. He had his back to her, but she knew just on seeing him that his eyes, when he turned around, would be her father's kind gray eyes, and she crept over and kissed him on the back of the head, balding head. Hello, Coraline, he said. Then he turned around and smiled at her. What was that for? Nothing, Coraline. I just miss you sometimes. That's all. Oh, good, he said. He put the computer to speak, stood up. To, and then, for no reason at all, he picked Coraline up, which he had not done for such a long time, not since 
when he started pointing up to her that she was too old to be carried, and he carried her into the kitchen. Tonight, dinner that night was pizza, and even though it was homemade by her father, so the crust was alternately thick and doughy and raw, and too thin and burnt. Or too thin and burnt. And even though he had even though he had put places of green pepper on it, along with little meatballs and, of all things, pineapple chunks, Quillen ate the entire slice she'd been given. Well, she ate everything except for the pineapple chunks. And soon, it, soon enough, it was bedtime. Quillen kept the key around her neck, but she put the gray marbles beneath her pillow and in the and in the bed that night, Corlin dreamed a dream. She was at a picnic under the uh, old, old, an old oak tree in a green meadow. The sun was high in the sky, and while there were distant fluffy white clouds on the horizon, the sky above her was deep and troubling blue. There was a white linen cloth laid on the grass with bowls piled high with food. She could see salads and sandwiches, nuts and fruits, jugs of lemonade and water, and thick chocolate milk. Corlin sat on one side of the tablecloth while the three other children took a, a side each. They were dressed in the other's clothes. The smallest of them, sitting on Corlin's left, was a boy with a red velvet knee, knee breeches and a frilly white shirt. His face was dirty, and he was piling his plate with a boiled, boiled meat potatoes, and with what looked like a cold, whole cooked tray of coffee. This is the finest of the picnic, lady, he said to her. Yes, I, I think it is. I wonder who organized it. I rather think you did, miss, said a tall girl sitting opposite her line, whose brown, rather shapely dress had a I'm bonnet on her head was tied beneath her chin. And we are more grateful for it, for all than ever words can say. She was eating slices of bread and jam, defying deaf, deftly cutting the bread from the golden, a large golden brown loaf with a huge knife, then spooning on to the uh, on the purple jam with a wooden spoon. She had jam all over her mouth. Aye, this is the finest food. What are you doing? This is the finest food I have eaten in centuries, said the girl. Fucking <laughs> egg. <sighs> Nope. She was a very pale child, dressed in what seemed to be a spider's web with a circle of glittering silver in her blonde hair. Coraline could have sworn that the girl had two wings, like dusty silver butterfly wings, not bird wings, coming out of her back. The girl's plate was piled high with pretty flowers. She smiled at Coraline as if it had been a very long time since she had smiled, and she had almost, but not quite, forgotten how. Coraline found herself liking the girl immensely, and then, in the way of dreams, the picnic was done. And they were playing in the meadow, running and shouting, and tossing a glittering ball from one to another. Well, I knew it was a dream then, because none of them ever got tired or winded or out of breath. She wasn't even sweating. They just laughed and ran in the game that was partly tag, partly piggy in the middle, and partly just a magnificent rock. Three of them ran over along the ground while the pale girl fluttered a little over their heads, swooping down on butterfly wings grab the ball and swing up again into the sky before she tossed the ball to one of the other children. And then without a word it began it, about it being spoken, the game was done. And the four of them went back to picnic cloth where the lunch dishes had been cleared away. 
And there were four bowls waiting for them, three of ice and cream, one of honeysuckle flowers piled high. They ate with relish. Thank you for coming to my party, said Coraline. If it is mine. Our pleasure is ours, Coraline Jones, said the winged girl, nibbling another honeysuckle blossom. If there were but something we could do for you, to thank you and to reward you, I said the boy, with the red velvet breeches and the dirty face. He put it, his, out his hands and held Coraline's hands with his own. It was warm now. It is very fine. It's a very fine thing you did for us, Miss," said the tall girl. She now had a smear of chocolate ice cream around her lips. This is pleased. It's all over," said Coraline. Was it her imagination, or did a shadow cross the faces of the other children at the picnic? She winked the winged girl in the circle, and her hair glittered like a star, resting her fingers for a moment on the back of Coraline's hand. It is done. And over with it is, it is over and done with for with for us, she said. This is our staging post. From here, we three will set out for enchanted lands. And what comes after us no after no one alive can say. She stopped talking. There's a fight, isn't there? Well, I can feel it, like a rainy cloud like a rain cloud. The boy on the left tried to smile bravely, but his lower lip began to tremble, and he bit it with his with his upper teeth and said nothing. The girl in the brown barn shifted uncomfortable and said, Yes, miss. But I got you you think that said Coraline. I got mum and dad blind. I shut the door, I locked it. What more was I meant to do? The boy squeezed Coraline's hand with his. She found herself remembering when when it had been she trying to rescue him when he was a little little more than a cold memory in the darkness. Well, can't you give me a clue, Quillen? Isn't there something you can tell me? The Belden swore by her good right hand, said the little girl, but she lied. I, my governess, said the boy, used to say that nobody is ever given more to, sh to shoulder than he or she can hear, she can bear. He shrugged as he said this, as if he had not made yet made his own mind whether or not it was true or not. We wish you luck, said the wind girl. Oh, yeah. Good fortune and wisdom to encourage, although you have already shown that you have all three of these blessings in, in abundance. She hates you, blurted out the boy. She hasn't lost anything for long, for so long. You eyes, we breathe, you tricky. But it's not fair, said Coraline in her dream angrily. It's just not fair. It should be over. The boy with the dirty face stood up and hugged Coraline, take it. Take comfort in this, he whispered. Thou art alive. Thou, thou livest. And in her dream, Coraline saw that the sun had set and the stars were twinkling in the dark moon sky. Oh, Bobby. Bobby! What the fuck is he doing? No! 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 No, get out of here. Come here. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. You know you're not supposed to be in here. Get out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and in her dream, Coraline saw that the sun was set, had set, and the stars were twinkling in the darkening sky. Coraline stood in the meadow. And watched as the three children, two of them walking, one flying, went away from her across the gate. Silver and the light of the men. The three of them came to a small wooden bridge over a stream. They stopped there and turned and waved, and Coraline waved back. And one came after was darkness. Coraline woke in the 
Early hours of the morning convinced she heard something bleeding, but unsure of what it was, she waited. Something made a rustling noise outside her bedroom door. She wondered if there was a rat. The door rattled. Caroline clambered out of bed. Go away, said Caroline sharply. Go away or you'll be sorry. There was a pause, then whatever it was scurried along down the hall. There was something odd and irregular about his footsteps. If there were footsteps, Caroline found herself wondering if it was perhaps a rat with an extra leg. It is an over, is it? She said to herself. Then she opened the bedroom door. The gray pre-dawn light showed her the whole of the corridor completely deserted. She went forward towards the front door, bearing a hastily glance back at the wardrobe door mirror hanging on the wall at the other end of the hallway, seeing not, nothing but her own pale face standing back her, looking sleepy and serious. Gentle, reassuring. came from her parents' room, but the door was closed. All the doors, all the doors of off the building were closed. Whatever, whatever the scuttling, scuttling thing was, it had to be here somewhere. Corlin opened the front door and looked in the gray sky. She wondered how long it would be until the sun came up. Wondering whether her dream had been a true thing while knowing in her heart that it had been. Something she had taken part of, the shadows under the hall, hall couch, detached itself from beneath the couch and made a mad scrabbling rush on its long white legs, heading for the front door. Corlin's mouth dropped open in horror and she stepped out of the way as the thing clicked and scurried past her and out of the house, running clock crab like on its too many tappings, clicking scurrying feet. She knew what it was, and she knew what it was after. She had seen it too many times in the last few days, reaching and clunking and snatching and popping up black, black beetles. Obediently into the other mother's mouth. Full, five footed, footed crimson nails, the color of bone. It was the other one right here. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that is it for chapter 12, I think. And, yeah, and we'll read the last chapter tomorrow. So, yes, uh, we will see if she escapes this thing. Obviously, I know what the hand is. Like, this is a creepy hand. Um, yes, and that is it. And I hope you have a good day. Bye-bye. Uh, how do I do it?